day, everybody, and welcome to the press community of interest um, prepared for you by the University of Toronto. I'm Anna Plotkin, I'm Director of the Continuous Professional Development. And, and really, uh, this meeting was prepared by Dr. Jesse Wu from St. Michael's Hospital. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. All of you will get a CME credit uh, and please uh, fill out the evaluation forms. And we match everybody uh, by attendance. So only people who attended uh, the meeting uh, will get the CME certificate. Uh, we have two uh, wonderful moderators of ours, Anna Marie Mulligan from University of uh, University. Uh, Health Network and uh, Sharon Norfolk Moses from Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. So uh, the podium is yours, Jesse. Please uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jesse Boo. I'm a staff pathologist uh, at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, and I'm the host for this meeting. Um, firstly, I just want to um, thank everyone for attending um, today's Breast Community of Interest meeting. Um, and we've had an incredible uh, number of uh, people registering for this event. Um, I think that has uh, a little something to do with our speaker today. Um, so we're going to kick off the meeting with a, a lecture on the uh, assessment of uh, key 67 in breast cancer. Um, this is a particularly timely, uh, timely topic. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been getting requests for key 67 from our oncologist colleagues kind of over the last year or so. Uh, so it's uh, my great first pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Torsten Nielsen. Uh, Prof Nielsen is a clinician, uh, sci uh, scientist pathologist from uh, UBC. Uh, his research has focused on breast cancer and sarcoma. And from the breast cancer front, uh, Prof Nielsen has been delivering kind of clinically practical predictive biomarkers um, using kind of tissue microarray and nanostring technology. Um, and as one of the leaders of the international key 67 working group, uh, his publication, um, up, you know, the updated recommendation from the international key 67 in breast cancer working group uh, back in July of last year, I mean, this is a, a must read for basically anyone doing any sort of key 67 uh, assessment uh, so without any further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Nielsen. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I will go straight to share screen, but um, I'm calling in from Vancouver, where you'll be uh, happy to hear that we have a snowstorm coming, um, which is uh, going to give us 20 centimeters today. And, and for those of you from Ontario, I think you know when we get even two millimeters here, people tend to panic and run around. So I'll probably take a snow day as soon as possible after this. <laughs> Let's um, let's go to um, my PowerPoint, um, which I hope is showing. Can you just give me a thumbs up, Jesse, if everyone's seeing it? Thank you. Okay, so the topic today is Key 67, and um, I will just jump right into it after that introduction. I think um, for um, uh, the reason that uh, of the abema Siklib controversy is part of the reason for inviting me today, and part of the reason I'm going to be presenting on this in a, in a shorter more condensed form at San Antonio uh, next week. But let's start by reminding you what Key 67 actually is, why we test for it, then going into the work of the International Key 67 Working Group, which has involved some of the people who uh, are on this call. And uh, I'm gonna end with um, some uh, new research, uh, Canadian research actually, that uh, suggests there may be even more indications for Key 67 in breast cancer. Now, I actually did my, my PhD in DNA replication biology um, a bunch of years ago, and uh, I'm very conscious that there are a lot of genes and proteins involved in DNA replication. In fact, through the cell cycle, you can imagine hundreds and thousands of genes will actually go up to replicate the DNA. It's a huge job for the cell. So there's many, many possible markers of proliferation we could have chosen. And out of all this, Key 67 has come through. I won't go into too much of the history, but it was developed, identified way back in 1984 by Johannes Gerdes. It is Key 67, not Ki 67, because it's named after the city of Kiel in Germany, which is where the first clone from Dr. Gerdes was, was identified with the first monoclonal antibody. There have been some important publications since then, but the most it, it took until 2016 for us to actually figure out what the hell this protein does, which is coat chromosomes and keep them from aggregating during mitosis. 
This means it's an abundant structural protein. It's not an enzyme. Its effects aren't amplified through enzymatic action like HER2 or, or a signaling proteins like ER. So it's a much more abundant and more stable protein than a lot of things we look for by IHC. Also, it's such a huge job to have enough of this protein around that the cells have to be making it, building it, and using it if they're anywhere in the cell cycle, uh, anticipating the subsequent mitosis. So that means it's expressed in G1, in M, and in G2, not just in the M phase, but it's rapidly catabolized and does not present in G0 cells that are, are not cycling. So very useful biological pattern. Moreover, from an IHC perspective, it has a unique domain called the key 67 domain seen only in this protein, nowhere else. So it's entirely specific in antibody against this epitope, which is what MIB-1 and, and several other of the antibodies will recognize. And to make it even better, that epitope is repeated 16 times over um, in the protein. So it's super sensitive. You will have 16 binding sites on each individual protein. Um, and to even top it off, this is in the C-terminal domain that's released with epitope retrieval technique. So it's an almost ideal situation for an IHC assay. And that's why it's fallen out of all of these possible proliferation markers we can choose. Despite that, as you know, there's still a lot of challenges. Um, but one thing it does mean is that the handling recommendations that have been painstakingly derived for ER and HER2 are plenty adequate for a key 67. Um, there are many Im indications now um, for key 67 with varying degrees of evidence and reasons that we would be asked to uh, deliver this biomarker, and I will touch on a few of them in this talk. But the bottom line is, regardless of a, a research study or a clinical trial that shows with centralized key 67 that has clinical validity for an indication like prognosis, need for gene expression testing, need for abemaciclib, in order to have clinical utility, you absolutely also need to have analytical validity. Can you measure it successfully, consistently, and reliably? You need both that and the clinical validity for it to be a usable test. And it's this controversy over analytical validity that's held back, for example, ASCO for recommending Key67 in routine clinical decision making. So knowing this, I was uh, one of the people that um, Dan Hayes and Mitch Dowsett invited to London a little over a decade now to review this literature and figure out what to do. We had an initial paper with recommendations of the state of literature at that time. This group didn't have that many pathologists in it. Judith Hugh um, was one of them. So we did have another Canadian pathologist in Beppe Viale, but otherwise we had oncologists, statisticians. And uh, the bottom line is that more work needed to be done to ensure um, whether the, we have a reliable delivery of this biomarker. And so this International Key 67 in Breast Cancer Working Group that has grown to involve um, other people, including several on this call who've made helpful contributions, uh, undertook a series of studies over six to eight years, really, um, that I'm going to go through relatively briefly to give you the evidentiary base here behind our scoring method that we recommend. Our first study um, involved quite a few cases, but not that many labs, um, and we used tissue microarrays just to uh, make this easier to uh, do this practically in our first studies. And um, we distributed centrally stained slides as well as unstained slides to be stained at individual laboratories and asked the pathologist there to repeatedly score them. This gave us data on how uh, an individual observer uh, was consistent within themselves, how um, consistent labs were um, lab to lab, um, and scores were between each other. And it let us break down the variability that we could see. Um, we found that um, individual pathologists were internally consistent with their scores, but between uh, scores, um, the uh, interclass correlation, which is a metric I'll, I'll talk about in, in a moment in a bit more detail, was uh, unacceptably low, and it got worse if you didn't use central staining. But we could break down the sources of variability, and most of the variability was scoring. It made more than double uh, the difference than staining uh, did. And so um, this meant we needed to figure out how to score things consistently. Another thing we found is that those labs that went to the effort of actually counting as opposed to doing eyeball estimates had uh, considerably tighter and more consistent data within themselves and were the drivers of the best uh, um, consistent methods. So 
at this point, um, we published that and it, it kind of put a, a damper on using key 67 um, in clinical practice, but we sought uh, to see whether we could solve these problems in reproducibility. And we tried to create an optimal situation where people just needed to look at a, at a, a specific a fixed TMA cores that represented the range of staining, and we would train them up in a specific method and um, give them the best possible chance of success, figuring that if you couldn't make it work under these conditions, we're never going to make it work. So these conditions included a calibration exercise where we had uh, digital images uh, that were available. Um, we had um, a, a uh, method that involved um, counting with a, a keyboard app to make it fairly quick and, and a practical guide on how to work your way through the TMA and um, pre-specified what you needed to agree. Um, we were able to capture sources of disagreement. So when we had an extreme case of disagreement, like shown here, uh, we were able to find that almost always us pathologists were in fact agreeing on which objects to score an invasive breast ductal cancer cell. Um, in fact, humans tend to be better at machines than machines at picking the right object, but there was a disagreement in how to interpret those, which basically was how brown does something have to be to call it positive. And we found that the, the solution to this was to set a very low threshold. Any brown in an in invasive breast cancer, breast cancer nucleus counts as positive. Um, having uh, added some sample images and that instruction, uh, scores did these training exercises. They had a separate test set. And having done that, everybody passed the test on the first or second time. So we knew that the labs were trainable, at least in this tool. But that was on a digital image. Could they do this on glass? So um, we sent around um, glass, uh, centrally stained glass slides, a again, tissue arrays, so we could have a, a large number of cases on each. We're now up to um, 16 labs participating at this level. And uh, we were able to capture how long it took them to score things as well. Um, so it was um, five to six minutes a case um, on, on this uh, format. Um, and at this point, we were ready to see whether it could meet our, our criterion for success. So an intraclass correlation statistic tells you how much of the variability across these 50 cases is attributable to biology, which is what we want to be measuring, differences in biology, as opposed to noise in the assay. So an ICC of 0.71 means 71% of the variability we measure is differences in biology and 29% is assay noise from staining and scoring put together. Um, and well, in this case, it would be staining only because, or scoring only, pardon me, because they're centrally stained slides. So um, we sent a, our pre-specified metric of success was 0.8 as the lower bound for the confidence interval, and we destroyed that by easily surpassing it once we went to this effort. This is an excellent ICC. Um, so I was actually pleasantly surprised. I thought that I would be able to walk away from all this research and, and say that um, we just can't deliver this in practice, but it looked like, well, at least here we could. The problem being this was on tissue microarrays. And we have to be able to do it on a, a clinically uh, relevant specimen like a core needle biopsy, let alone a whole section, where now you have a big additional factor of which area am I going to score? So um, this was the subject of uh, the next phase of the study. I'd like to uh, thank people like Sharon and, and Anita, if she's on this call, um, Susanna, Doris, Martin, when he was here. So there was a big Canadian contribution um, amongst the groups participating at this level of the study. Um, and um, what we had to do at the beginning was uh, figure out how we're going to decide which areas to score. There's controversy in the field. Do you do hotspot scoring or do you attempt to average across the slide? Um, so we asked our pathologists to do both methods to see uh, what they did when they used this interpretation technique. Um, we created an app that's freely available, uh, still available through our website. You can put it on your phone. You can put it on your desktop. It makes it easy to do the counting, a bit like a hemochromocytometer. It'll beep when you're positive, negative, or when you've reached enough scores. It, gave, it gives the instructions for hotspot and global counting or facilitates that. A hotspot is fairly obvious. You pick the single area and attempt to work your way through that high power field and get 500 nuclei. Um, the global method involves in starting off by at low power estimating how much of the slide has low, medium, and high areas. The app will tell you how many of those fields to count 100 nuclei in, 
and then uh, it'll aggregate the score for you. This, this method is based on what was going on in Mitch Dowsett's lab for the poetic trial and had been shown to have clinical validity um, in their trials. The results uh, showed global doing a bit better than hotspots. Um, it's hard to get individual points in ICC, although these confidence intervals overlap, but importantly, our, our pre-specified boundary of success was only met with the global uh, method. So that's what we adopted. Uh, this is because hotspots, um, we need them for mitotic counting because we don't have a lot of objects that are positive. So we need to zoom in on that to get reasonable numbers to count. But with key 67, that's not a constraint. You've got lots of positive objects spread over the field. Uh, and if you do hotspots, um, you'll find that not everyone agrees on what the hotspot is, especially in the lower key 67 index cases. And even when some people do all agree, like in, in the case on the far right there, even where you center the field to start counting can make a big difference. So fields that are slightly off from each other can result in, in big differences in the uh, key 67 index that are reported. So this is part of the reason we've advocated a global scoring, even though it is a little bit harder. Um, but our ICC number, even going from these tissue microarrays now to a full core needle biopsy, is surprisingly good. Um, the main downside being it's taking longer. Um, our Japanese delegates are fine with 10 minutes a case. Our American delegates are not. Uh, knowing the workload you guys have, you probably have a lot of trouble delivering this in practice. And so it's a reason for being very picky about which cases actually need to have key 67 scoring done as opposed to making it routine for everything. Anyway, uh, we beat the uh, pre-specified criteria and um, had a method that worked on core needles. Uh, quickly, we did follow this up on whole sections as well, including a nice set of cases where we had whole sections matched to core needles from the same cases that were provided from Britain and, and Japan. Uh, this went out to a dozen countries and lab, more than that labs. Um, and uh, could we do this on full face sections from the excision specimen? The answer is yes. Uh, we had very similar results. Global, again, doing a bit better than hotspot and global being the only one that met the pre-specified criterion of success. So data almost the same. However, there's a different bias set point here. So even though people are agreeing, um, one important finding was that the core needles routinely from the same case yielded higher key 67 scores than the cognate uh, whole section analysis, uh, possibly due to fixation, uh, possibly due to uh, directing of the needle into the center of the spec or, or into the areas of the specimen, but regardless, they're not equivalent to each other, and we recommend that the core needle, much like for ER and HER2, is the uh, better uh, specimen to be using. Um, I won't have time to go into automated imaging. That has also been analyzed by our group. Uh, this is a summary of all of our studies. This is the big bump up we get when we standardize scoring on tissue arrays, and it doesn't drop off too much moving to clinical specimens. Uh, phase three AI is just without standardizing on digital images. They, they do a good job. And when you standardize them, the performance is about the same uh, of the standardized uh, digital technique as with the standardized visual technique. At this point, almost all the variability in uh, between cases is biology. Uh, it's no longer the observer, i.e. scoring, and there isn't that much of a contribution from staining. Uh, as mentioned in my, the introduction, uh, we've summarized these results in, in a paper that um, I think the publication date is December, but it didn't, indeed came out in, in July of last year. So I encourage you to read it if you need follow up. It does summarize all this and, and more. Uh, but as my summary, our consensus is the ASCO CAP guiding, uh, handling guidelines for breast cancer that we've adopted are, are adequate for more than adequate for key 67. You need to set a low threshold for brown. You need to train and calibrate on standardized images if you're going to result in, in a, if you're going to have a method that's similar to what other people are using. Um, we have a global visual scoring method that, that is uh, supported by an app or a digital analysis can work as well. And as for staining, we recommend being part of a quality assurance program that includes Key67 to make sure things are brown enough. Um, the instructions for how to pick up this particular scoring system are, are present on our website and the link is here and, and in the paper. 
Another conclusion we were able to draw was that there is still residual variability. And if you want to take that into account and make a conservative call, you can only be really, really sure you have a, a, a super low risk breast cancer if you're 5% or less, or really certain you have a high risk breast cancer with 30% index or more. And everyone in between may need a gene expression profile if, if we're looking at risk profiling um, uh, around how aggressive to do therapy. Now I'm gonna change gears to the abema syphilis controversy, which is the reason your oncologists, uh, many of your oncologists have been calling you up. Um, so um, abema syphilis is a, a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Feclin-dependent kinases uh, four and six are um, cell cycle control proteins that control when you're entering S phase. Um, fun fact, if you have an ER negative cancer, they usually have deleted the retinoblastoma protein or other cell cycle controls so that CDK4-6 are irrelevant to their biology, which is why these inhibitors are, are relevant in the ER positive group only. They have proven value in metastatic recurrent ER positive breast cancer. But the big thing that happened in the last year was a, a major study on adjuvant uh, use of abemaciclib called Monarchy e reported. And it showed that there was indeed a benefit for abemaciclib even in the adjuvant setting. This is a big trial, uh, lots of patients followed long-term. Uh, they're still being followed right now, but they reported based on the first three years. This um, Kaplan-Meier curve shows you a couple of important things. The gap between the orange and the blue line is the benefit of abemaciclib. Keep in mind the cutoff here is 70, so it always makes these look a bit bigger than they are at an absolute level. Um, and uh, at the bottom in solid lines are the key 67 high group. And this was pre-specified as a stratum in the analysis of this trial as a 20% cut point. So 20% or higher here at the, the top two dashed curves are the lower than 20% key 67 group. You will notice there's still a, a gap between these curves. That means that key 67 is, or that abemaciclib is benefiting everybody. It's just that the um, absolute difference is proportional to your initial risk. Your initial risk is higher if you're key 67 high. And so um, this means that key 67 is not actually a predictive marker for a demosiclov benefit. It is a prognostic marker. And it's just that the magnitude of difference is higher if you are key 67 high. And what FDA looked at at the data at this point was they looked at the overall survival data, which was a secondary endpoint in this trial, and noted that the overall survival data did not show a clear benefit if you were key 67 low, possibly side effects of the drug, possibly other reasons, but there was not a clear overall survival benefit in that group. And for that reason, they decided to approve adjuvant abemaciclib only for patients who are key 67 greater than or equal to 20%, and specifically only for those who, uh, in the context of the assay and interpretation method that was used in the Monarch E trial. Um, this is controversial to say the least. I was one of the people actually on a call with FDA about this. Um, they took the unusual step of publishing a whole article justifying why they did it this way. Um, our rebuttal article is also out as of uh, uh, June this year in JCO. Um, the short version is that remember that everybody is getting a benefit from this drug. The magnitude is proportional to risk. Um, clinical risks as well as key 67, any risk factor for breast cancer will portend a larger magnitude of adjuvant abemaciclib. Um, and um, the uh, key 67 was, uh, approval was uh, required by FDA at this stage based on data that's not yet fully matured for overall survival. Their approval is specific for the DACO Omnis system that was used for the central staining in that trial. Um, they have something called a summary of safety and effectiveness document that describes the detail. Uh, that was some of that is reproduced in the package handout from ACO from DACO, and uh, a publication, a sporting publication, came out in April, um, which includes, as I dug into it, four pathologists, only one of whom actually I think is a breast cancer specialist. Anyway, I've gone through all of these things, and the bottom line is they went to a, an admirable amount of effort in detailing the data for how to standardize staining uh, with a detailed checklist that confirms that the test is robust to most factors affecting staining. 
But nonetheless, the approval is as performed on the DACO on this system, which is um, used by maybe 2% of labs. I don't know. Um, so we'll talk about it in, in a bit, uh, what that means. Uh, they have a detailed checklist, um, which includes a lot of smart things to, to standardize how you do um, IHC staining. Um, they provide some sample images um, in their package handout. Um, overall, as mentioned, most of the effort is in uh, staining. Um, I actually want to thank the group who published this for doing uh, workup that we never got around to in the IKWG uh, group. Uh, I think they did a nice job uh, talking about staining and in fact showing that for most of these features it's easy to standardize uh, in a manner that will limit variability in staining. Um, the scoring on the other hand had a lot less detail and it's based on data from just three pathologists actually who, who generated this data and they did it by eyeball estimates in 5% immigrant increments after training on sample images. They also use statistics that are kind of dubious because their gold standard truth of whether was something was, first off, they didn't, they just ended up binning everything as higher or lower than 20%. The gold standard truth was defined as whatever two of the pathologists said. Um, so um, the minimum agreement if the data had been random would have been 67%. Um, so I, I thought that it really was a way to mask the true variability and you really need a lot more data if you really want to think this will hold up. I, I think it's extremely unlikely that their method would hold up. And in fact, in their um, interpretation manual, it's even worse because they, they just say that bottom line is, you know, do the scoring based on your past experience and best judgment in interpreting IHC. Uh, that's easy. People, you know, reading this can, can uh, make up their mind in a few seconds and throw out a number. Uh, it just uh, seems very unlikely that it would hold analytical validity uh, based on uh, a lot of data that a lot of us have been generating over a long time. Here's here's some of it, just reminding us there's a lot of variability in the in the five to thirty percent range, um, even around the twenty percent range. Even when you try and standardize things, you're going to get a gray zone, um, which is not really acknowledged in in this approval and that it's a quantitative marker, not really a, a cut point marker per se. Nonetheless, despite all that, there's a lot of agreement between what the International Key 67 Working Group and the Monarch E investigators have done, for example, on pre-analytical handling, on, on using a, a low threshold for how brown a nucleus has to be, uh, the need for some training and calibration on standardized images, um, that global methods rather than hotspot methods are better, um, uh, but we have some big problems, right? Most of us don't have a DACO on this system. We've got um, a different immunostainer. Um, we're not going to get a multi-hundred thousand dollar new piece of equipment in for just this indication. We're not going to go and re-optimize every single antibody in our labs, especially when we have a perfectly good Key 67 we're using every day, not only for breast cancer, for pancreatic cancer, for all kinds of cases when you, you, you want to help figure out if it's benign or malignant. Um, so it's totally unrealistic to think everyone's going to have that. In fact, everyone is going to be off label anyway. Um, you know, as Canadians, we're not beholden to an FDA label as it is, but even in the US, everyone's going to be doing lab developed tests. So we're off label anyway. Um, what do we do about this? Well, you could do bridging studies. Um, in fact, some of the investigators involved in the original study of abemaciclib showed a bridging study to a different DACO auto stainer um, and trumpeted that it agreed. Although if you look at the data, it actually, the overall agreement actually drops a little bit, uh, which is not, not surprising. Um, the IKWG, my colleague David Rim, our colleague David Rim has published a really nice tool, um, a tissue microarray with mixing um, cells that are 100% Key67 positive with, with cells with no Key67 recognized by the antibody uh, to create a gold standard tissue array you can use for QC. Um, so that's a nice tool. This is important to use a test, uh, a, a scoring test that isn't based on wishful thinking that pathologists will agree, but rather on hard data that they will agree. This is a study from Sweden. Um, they had a, a central lab in Sweden that said, you know, you can do this by our way. Uh, we agree internally, look at the hotspot count uh, 200 cells, here's some visual reference. But they never validated it uh, beyond their own lab. They just mandated that everyone in their country use it. So everyone did, 29 institutions for uh, five years. And here's 40,000 data points. And what is plotted here is actually the mean key 67 score across each 
participating hospital, each representing hundreds of cases. And this tells you the set point that pathologists have related to how brown something is, how they want to uh, decide where a hotspot is. And you can see a big problem here, right? That the mean score across hundreds of cases in these different hospitals with their own groups of pathologists is varying from 15% to 30%. And as seeing this data, the Swedes have just moved over to the IKWG method um, because that at least has been validated in a distributed setting. Um, the other thing we can advocate, it doesn't mean this is the only method that works. I'm just saying you need to have a method that's truly been validated beyond your own lab if you're going to um, expect to get results that are similar to what other people are showing on the same cases, if you will. Um, quantitative automated digital imaging can do it as well, um, and uh, we have some papers out about that. I can take questions on that, but um, it isn't quite standard of care at this point yet in our field and does add uh, different workflow issues. Um, we're trying to help people with the scoring as best as possible. So the, the website is, is up and available. Um, we've recently had to do a security update. Do get back to me if you have any trouble accessing the software if you're trying to use it. Uh, but it does raise one last issue, which is can we actually benchmark this 20% cut point to the IKWG method? For example, if there's a set point bias difference, how are we going to know? We've encouraged the researchers to actually put out the images, um, but you know they, they haven't done that yet. And so this makes it really difficult. Um, there are certain key 67 applications where um, you're not using a uh, one cut point, but rather looking for a difference, say, between before and after the same pathologist looking at it. And in those cases, we may not have so many benchmarking issues, but that, that is an issue. Um, our bottom line in, in our, our commentary in JCO is that it's um, uh, that we have a lot of concerns. Um, and I'm going to talk about how these can be, be mitigated in the next couple slides. One thing to realize is that the whole abemacycle of controversy um, it may be a moot point because all patients do benefit. In fact, if you look at the data, although they had a pre-specified 20% cut point, it looks very clear that unless you have a really low key 67, you're getting quite a bit of benefit still from abemaciclib. And so if you, um, uh, if you overcall things or if you get this wrong around the gray area, I don't think you're making a mistake. The, the patients um, had, had a chance to benefit. In fact, ASCO and the NCCN have put out their own guidelines uh, based on the monarchy data as they see it to suggest that you should ignore key 67 if you uh, have lots of nodes or a big tumor or you're high grade um, in, in node positive women where this indication is. And in multiple European jurisdictions, they're not requiring key 67. Moreover, next week on Tuesday, one week today, there's going to be an updated presentation at San Antonio. I don't know what the results are. I just know I'm getting hints from at least one of the authors that um, these overall survival curves are widening over time as they follow patients. And it may become more clear that um, abemaciclib, uh, the risk benefit is favorable even if the key 67 is low. So it, it may render it moot. That being said, you still need to know how to score Q67 if you're working on breast cancer, um, because there are uh, probably other reasons still to do so and other cut points that might be relevant. For example, the Germans have published um, this ADAPT trial uh, series um, that suggests a new adjuvant endocrine therapy um, can be uh, is good enough and you don't need chemo if, um, if your key 67 is low following treatment. And, and although I've run a little bit over time, I do want to highlight this Lumina result because some of the people on this call have worked for it. It's a Canadian finding. It's a study from the Ontario, uh, from the OCOG group that many of you may have participated in that Tim Whalen led. Um, and it shows a really interesting result. Um, this was presented at ASCO, and I want to share this result with you if you haven't seen it yet uh, in the context of Q67. This is about, do we even need to give adjuvant radiation therapy to women who have low-risk breast cancer? Um, it's known that if you just use clinical factors, uh, size, um, et cetera, of existing factors, that you can't identify a super low-risk group who get no benefit from radiation. But if you add a molecular marker, maybe you can. And so this study used the luminal A cut point, which is 13% as a pre-specified criterion. It used a rigorous Q67 scoring in a deliberately distributed setting, not just one central lab, but labs 
it, at McMaster at U of T and in Vancouver, who used this method to identify if women who had the right low risk factors were also low key 67. And those women who signed up for this trial did not receive standard of care radiation. They got no radiation and we crossed our fingers and hoped and we've been following them to see if indeed they did not get recurrences. And um, we had a built-in QC, Anita Bain led this work showing that these labs agreed with each other. The method was actually a little more rigorous than the uh, key 67 uh, method we published because when we designed this, we only had um, tissue array data. So we had a creative way of, of doing that, but it's very similar to the IKWG method, um, although done from a digital image. And we've subsequently shown uh, on these same studies that the IKWG final method gives equivalent results. Anyway, if you were low key 67, you got in this trial, 26 centers across Canada accrued over five years, um, 750 or so uh, got screened and two thirds of them were low key 67 were put in the trial. And this is the big result. Our pre-specified definition of success was if the recurrence rate for local recurrence was under 5% with no radiation and we got 2.3%. So the trial is a success. These women can get away without radiation. In fact, the local recurrence rate was about the same as the contralateral breast cancer rate which suggests that those things we're calling local recurrences may in fact be new primaries and the radiation may not have pre prevented them anyway. Um, there's just one death for the overall survival endpoint. So this study is, is a big success, suggesting that if you had a luminal A level of low key 67, you don't need radiation. Um, so we're writing that up right now. We'll see if it becomes practice changing. And there are some other trials that may uh, report similar data over the next couple of years. Last slide, sorry I've talked so much. Um, the bottom line is despite my skepticism with the early data, it's clear that if you validate your scoring and have QC programs in place, you have a robust analyte here. Um, the IKWG method is one that works in distributed setting and there are multiple possible cut points that have clinical utility, uh, some which may not stay indicated, some which may become indicated, um, but it's a dynamic space in breast cancer research. I'm gonna end there. Um, I didn't put acknowledgement slide up. I've uh, highlighted several of the um, researchers who participated through their papers. I see Anna Marie, uh, Sharon on this call. Thank you for your contributions. And to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation who provided some uh, financial support for these studies. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nielsen. Uh, fantastic talk, uh, very informative. Uh, I'm sure there are Lots and lots of questions. So I would open the floor and if anyone's got any questions, please go ahead. So maybe uh, if uh, the audience uh, have not submitted yet uh, their questions, I can ask a question. So uh, Torsten, uh, what uh, would be your recommendation to us as practicing breast pathologists when uh, we pick up the phone and there is a medical oncologist on the line and every week there is a different indication another paper comes out and uh it's the poetic it's the lumina is whatnot and they ask us to do it should we just a uh, uh open our lis and order the stain or uh express some reservations uh, both. You should do both. Uh, you made it easy for me with that second one, of course. Um, but, you know, what are we here for? We're here to help patients. The oncologists are the ones doing it. You need to make sure, I mean, they need to know that it's a lot of effort for us and that um, there's a um, possibility that our, uh, uh, that, our an that our analyte and our interpretation doesn't match what was done in the original trial. They need to convince us that they're going to make a clinical decision and a management change based on the result you deliver. And if they're going to do that, and this is clearly going to help for a patient, then, then we should do the staining, we should do the scoring, we should score it. You should, I think you should train yourself if you're a breast cancer pathologist in, in a, a scoring method that will hold up. And ultimately, I think if you find that these are happening a lot, a lot, a lot, and it's burning a lot of time, then it would be time to consider um, investing in, in a digital image analysis uh, method um, that would um, take some of the load off of uh, those of us, who, which is all of us who have a plenty big load already. 
Susan, you have a question? Yes, th thanks, Sharon. Um, and thank you, Torsten. That was a fantastic and very, very comprehensive talk. Um, two, two issues. Um, one is you did say that you might, if it was asked in the questions, you might talk about automated scoring mm. um, and you know, give us your thoughts on that. And the second thing is about um, QAQC programs. We participate in this, the College of American Pathologists, ERPR and HER2. Are they, do, are they planning to do a similar thing for KI67? Are you aware of anything like that? Sure. I'll do the usual thing of answering the second question first, but I didn't forget the first one. So yes, uh, David Rim is is right now working on it hard and working on it with his colleagues to uh, in, to bring in Key 67. Um, it's possible they're holding their breath till next week, San Antonio, but um, the Abema cycle of indication has really lit a fire. So that's moving ahead. Um, uh, in terms of automated uh, analysis, um, so um, what I was struck by with automated analysis is we, we used many, we used the same cases that had gone through this visual scoring analysis, and we just sent them around to um, a somewhat different group of labs uh, to just say, go ahead and use whatever automated analysis method you use um, um, and uh, see whether they agree or not. Um, that included their own scanners. So we sent them the slide where they didn't just work from the digital image. And uh, right off the bat, their ICC values were, um, over 0.8, um, it just, they, uh, so it was surprisingly how consistent they were, um, considering people use different platforms and software. And then um, uh, David Raymond and a lab uh, developed um, an open source free software, QUPath uh, software that's freely available to anyone and designed to work on a digital image, however they captured it. Um, uh, the, except if they use a proprietary, so there's, there are certain uh, scanners that will generate a proprietary format, so you'd be careful about that. But if they can generate a TIFF or a JPEG or something that you know everybody uses, you can get a free software that other people have used. And when that was run in our study on these same cases, it brought up that ICC again a little bit more. Now it matched what we got from the visual, and it was faster and easier. Um, it's just an economies of scale thing, right? If you're just looking at the occasional thing and you're trained pair of eyes looking at your glass right away, you get a, a nice answer. But if you're going to do a lot of this and it's an institutional decision and large, then then um, set up the scanners. Um, you know, there, by the way, there's some departments that have through COVID have gone completely digital, like at UCSF, for example, as, as I've learned. So it may come to all of us uh, soon enough. Yeah, okay, that's fantastic. Yeah, I've been doing it um, using image analysis. And I mean, is it, if you're going to go the automated route, is there a minimum number of cells you think we should be scoring? Um, I'd probably have to go back to the paper. Um, the thing is, right, the automated route has the huge advantage of being able to score everything quite yeah. easily, right? So yeah. I, I don't, you know, there would be a minimum, I guess, statistically, if you have a really crappy sample. Um, but you know that that would be the because the the machine's going to count everything for you, and your numbers are going to be much higher than the human counter is because you don't have that really upper level constraint. So um, you know, I think even the Swedes said uh, two hundred cells, although then they didn't get consistent numbers. So I don't know that. I'd say four hundred cells, um, okay. sort of the minimum number of the human counting um, that we would get with our our app. Okay. Um, yeah. And below that, an inadequate specimen. I think there is a number from the Abema Cyclob people of the number of cells, and I believe it's 200 that they say. Okay. Um, Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Torsten, that was um, great. I uh, very much enjoyed that. I just have a question about um, uh, the app. I have been using it, and I know Sharon is going to go into more detail on it later. Um, but um, you know, it's a great app. I find it so useful, and it really makes everything easier when we're counting the Q67. Um, I have a question about when. What would your recommendation be regarding counting more than the 400 um, cells? Would you look at heterogeneity, or does the the weighted global estimate um, help with that? Um, and when, you know, do you recommend at any point we should get a second um, person into count, like if it fell very close to the cut point? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, on a practical level, do you have any sort of advice to help uh, guide us? Um, I haven't done a whole lot. Um, unfortunately, so far, all the results have fallen above 20. So uh -huh. I've sort of been relieved that I'm not in that difficult position of wondering how much more I should do. Yeah. 
Um, okay, um, so part of the Anna Marie's question comes, she was one of the people involved in the Lumina trial. And um, and that uh, earlier version of the app, uh, the, the version you're using now, it's still making all the beeping and booping sounds, mm -hmm. right, uh, Anna Marie? I mean, it's not, it sounds like you're typing up Morse code, by the way. Beep, beep, boop, boop, beep, beep, boop, boop. It really it's feels like you're accomplishing something <laughs> and it ring a little bell when you're when you reach the number. So it, it's it's makes it a it makes it fun, I think. Anyway, uh, but if you have too many of them, it, it certainly becomes less fun. Um, the um, uh, so when we did the trial, um, Anne Marie knows this. The the um, software did take into account heterogeneity and asked you to score extra cores if the difference between different circles was too much. And um, we also had a system where if if the value that you ended up with was close to the uh, cut point, we would have a second pathologist score. And if that pathologist fell on the other side of the cut point, we'd actually have a third pathologist. So we, we, we were very thorough. That was a clinical trial situation, although you can argue an immediate patient care decision might in, in require just as much rigor. What I can say is, Anne-Marie, after we got the uh, Lumina result, um, we, uh, I know Susanna's on this call because she helped with this. Um, we uh, ran out and checked whether the IKWG method would give similar results to what we had done in Lumina with that computer method that did include additional taking into account of heterogeneity. And basically the results were very similar. So I think while you're talking about an admiral amount of rigor to add additional cores um, that you don't need to. Uh, uh, you still get decent results. That's great, thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of questions um, in the chat um, area. Yeah. But, um, so, up, but which one yeah. would you like me to answer? Uh, we've got three so far. Um, okay, is there any yeah. value in doing key 67 on post neoadjuvant case and then on the breast biopsy that was done prior to the treatment request of medical oncologists? Well, um, you'd have to ask the medical oncologist um, what they're going to do with the difference. The answer may be yes. Um, there are, this is, there's clinical trials that are window of opportunity studies where they're looking at the treatment effect. Um, and um, so um, if the oncologist is going to change their um, change their management based on this. I, I'm worried about this approach because of the data I showed you that if you if you have a, a core biopsy and you have a whole section on the same case without new adjuvant, that number is going to drop. So you people are going to attribute that uh, to the benefit of the therapy. Um, but uh, nonetheless, if they if that's what was done on the original clinical trial and they've found a number, it's often 10%, you know, a drop in uh, key 67 that that will mean that their therapy worked or it didn't work. And hence, in the adjuvant setting, they're going to do something different than the new adjuvant setting. Um, so I, I think as was alluded to, it's a fast moving field. There's a lot of evidence in, in breast cancer that's changing a lot. So just ask your oncologist um, if they're going to change their management based on the result. Um, I would say, and I'm sorry I have too long answers to every question, um, in that situation, based on the data I've seen, you might not have to go to that huge amount of effort to do the proper count on both specimens. As long as it's your pair of eyes and you're assessing them the same way and you are looking at the before and you are looking at the after, it won't matter what your bias set point is. Uh, because the difference should be about the same, and they're only caring about the difference. So I don't know if that helps at all. Um, sorry, Jesse, uh, when these things work, or you, you're the one who's supposed to read the question to me, right? So oh, I, I can do that, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, the next, <laughs> so the next next question is uh, from uh, Pratipa uh, Iyengar. Um, so in addition to participating in a QA program, is there a minimum minimum number of cases each pathologist needs to score in order to be competent in reporting key 67 is this better to be ref or is this ref better to be referred to a central site so i don't have the real data for that of course this is the case for most things in medicine that you need a certain amount of experience however the point of the calibration exercise is supposed to be there to train you um, and um, the data we have suggests that having done that training, you can be consistent with others. Um, it also has a test set. So 
Um, yeah, it's probably better to if someone has more experience, um, they're more likely to, but I don't have specific data. Uh, the data I have would suggest that as long as you're a, a competent uh, pathologist who looks at breast cancers a reasonable amount of time and looks at key 67 in other contexts a reasonable amount of time, you go through this training exercise and you're, you're as good to participate as anybody. Unless that you were asking that because you wanted to get out of having to score these themselves and put them to everybody else. Uh, in which case, uh, um, yeah. So uh, I, anyway, that that's my best answer. All right. Um, so the next next question is: um, In your experience, is key sixty seven score more binary or more cases are about the cut point? So it, so the cut point for breast cancers. Yeah, key sixty seven is not a binary marker. It's a continuous variable. Um, it has a log normal distribution with the mean score in the 15 to 20% range across most distributions. Um, so it's not a binary. And in fact, it's, it doesn't have like a bimodal distribution or something that you really would expect a cut point should be applied to. Um, these cut points give you nice Kaplan-Meier curves. Um, every, no matter what cut point you pick, everyone higher than cut point is going to do worse than everyone lower than that cut point and tell you that. Um, so all the cut points are kind of artificial. Um, they, they matter in the sense like in a Bemaciclib where they do track with an absolute amount of risk that you have. And at a certain point, that absolute amount of risk is so low that um, you don't need to keep intervening. All right. Does anyone else have a question? Yes, um, so I do have a question. So what if you count for 100 cells and you're around 18 or 19 percent, like really close to the cutoff? I think you alluded to it. Would you count another 400, do image analysis, or what would be your approach? I would report it as 18 percent because that's the result I got. Um, you know, um, if you if you decide I will add, I will add fields because it's 18 percent, but you're not going to add fields because it's 22%. Um, you're going to bias your results to being positive. Now, you can do that if you want, because as I said, the patients with 18% are still going to benefit from a bang the sick load. If someone's pressuring you to get this drug uh, available to them, you're not making a horrible error if you, um, you, know, if you get it wrong. Uh, but at the same point, these are really expensive drugs. And, and although it benefits, the absolute benefit is still a few percent. So it's not a horrible mistake if they don't get the drug either. Um, so, you know, I guess as a scientist, I'd say you pre-specified how you run this test. This is the result you got. You report the result and you're done. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? No, well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nelson. That's that's uh, that was a very informative um, talk. Um, I'm sure all of us benefited a lot um, from your lecture. Um, so, if, if, oh, Dr. Donna, you have another question? No, I was applauding. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Oh, I, sorry. Could sorry. Tell, yeah. I could tell oh, one yeah. person liked my talk. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> See you in San Antonio. <laughs> Uh, you know what? Thank you very much, guys. Um, and uh, yeah, I, and for those of you at San Antonio, there, there is a section, Translational Controversies Key 67, which will be about this. And that will be delivered in the context of this other result having just come out on the Tuesday they don't know about. So keep watching this space. And um, yeah, uh, all the best to everybody. Um, uh, thank you for all your hard work. And sorry if I made your work more difficult sometimes. But the data is the data. You know? okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, so we're going to move on to um, our uh, presentation uh, portion. Um, so the first one is going to be uh, Professor Sharon of Akinosis, and um, this is going to lead straight on from the uh, talk that we just had. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. 
So, uh, yeah, I just uh, felt that maybe after Torsten, a fantastic scientific presentation uh, will kind of uh, land uh, from the sky down to everyday uh, work. And I wanted to uh, just present to you uh, one case where K67 was requested. So the patient is 46 year old a, at the time of diagnosis. And uh, she had a left invasive breast carcinoma. She had DCIS on the right. Uh, and uh, this was a positive for ERPR and negative for HER2 with a score of one plus and maybe soon we will call it her too low. Uh, so she underwent an excision that uh, uh, really uh, demonstrated that the lesion was uh, way larger than initially um, appreciated on imaging. Uh, she had the main mass that was 10 centimeters uh, uh, with focal areas of high-grade tumor and uh, numerous additional foci, but all of them were under three millimeters. Uh, on the, the lymph node uh, um, front, she had one macrometastasis of four millimeter without extra nodal extension. And two of the lymph nodes uh, had uh, isolated tumor cells that could only be appreciated uh, by immunohistochemistry. So uh, she had a dose dense ACT and radiation therapy post mastectomy due to the um, high risk features. And uh, then she was put on monthly Lupron plus uh, letrozole and adjuvant zoldenic uh, acid. However, given her high clinical risk, the patient uh, was considered for abemacyclib and they requested K67. Uh, just uh, about uh, two months ago. So uh, this is a, a low power view of the core biopsy. Um, and uh, here are some uh, of the um, uh, high uh, power images. And we can see um, this is a an invasive lobular carcinoma, and it doesn't look particularly pleomorphic. And definitely, when I, I um, looked back at the age and &E, I didn't see that many mitotic figures. And uh, one thing to uh, say from a practical point of view is that a, my suggestion is never to report biomarkers without looking at the uh, age and &E first so that you can uh, have a feel to how these uh, neoplastic cells would look like. Um, and uh, in cases with a uh, lobular carcinoma, sometimes the nuclear size is not much uh, greater than a lymphocyte. So this is going to be um, a source of confusion sometimes. And uh, here is the low power view of uh, K67. And on the low power, you uh, kind of think that, oh, maybe this is quite homogeneous and I can eyeball it and just get along with it. Uh, however, um, being on the um, international group, I am absolutely a big fan of the K67 uh, app and it is installed on my phone. So uh, my suggestion is to use it. So uh, at this point, uh, just uh, open the app and identify uh, the areas that are negligible, low, medium, and high K67 labeling in relation to this case. These are not cutoff that are rigid across cases. is just to capture heterogeneity. You then select the scoring type as global and um, you then uh, determine the proportion of each level of K67 staining in relation to the specific case. So um, in 
uh, the core that I showed you, I identified areas that uh, I called negligible or very, very low. And here are two areas that uh, suited uh, this uh, relative definition. Um, I identified some areas that were actually low, and you can see even with the uh, eyeballing that it's more than what I selected for negligible. I uh, selected areas that I identified as medium expression, and uh, then, of course, there were also areas with high expression. However, the proportion of each of these a level of expression is a bit different. So you need to really spend a, a, little, a couple of minutes uh, trying to uh, uh, decide what is the weight or what is the proportion of each of these expression levels. And this is what I captured in the app. The reason that there is a 6% here and a 29 is just that these are a bars that you move and sometimes your hand is not as steady. So maybe I wanted it to be 5%, but ended up being six, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, and then uh, the apps asks you to count four sets of 100 cells with a 100 cells in each of these category, negligible, low, medium, and high. And uh, as Torsten uh, showed you twice the screenshots, you will have a button that says negative and another one that says positive. And you can uh, keep on focusing on the actual microscope and just put two fingers on this negative and positive and just go ding, 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 dong, 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 ding, 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 dong, 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 until it says uh, poof, you hit a hundred and um, you are prompt to uh, recount the next set of a uh, hundred cells in the next category. So for this particular case, um, I uh, got uh, the unweighted global score, which is just an average of those 400 cells that I counted at 33%. But because the proportion of high was uh, quite uh, significant, I estimated it at 50%. Uh, the weighted global score was 465 um, so uh, basically in our practice, I uh, report the two methods and the scores. And it's always nice to have both of them on the same side of 20%. But uh, from conversations that I had with a couple of medical oncologists, if you have one that is more than 20%, they are going to use that one to request access to a bamacyclib because uh, basically as we know and we just heard everybody would benefit only the magnitude or the absolute uh, benefit is maybe uh, more significant in uh, those above 20 percent so they just want to have access for the drug uh, so in this case, I uh, reported it. We uh, are using the synoptic report. Uh, CAP has a KI-67 um, field in the synoptic report, and uh, we basically modified it a little bit so that uh, we're able to uh, report both the weighted and the global unweighted, which is the, just the percentage. We also indicate that a uh, we had uh, counted 400 cells. Uh, the antibody that we're using, as you can see, is not the PharmDX, MIB1, is actually um, the Ventana A 3090 clone. And uh, I also use a disclaimer to say that the essay has not been specifically validated for prognostic or predictive purposes in breast cancer. And um, that's include the selection uh, of patients for a uh, abemocyclib therapy, because uh, honestly, a um, 
we don't have a very, very strong evidence that all um, K67 staining methods are equivalent to the one used in a Monarch E trial. So as for our patients, um, I reported her K67 at the end of September, and I checked her uh, medical records. Uh, the drug was approved for her uh, based on K67 uh, on October 14th. And um, then I found the following uh, note to say she's motivated and has made a decision to start a BEMA since she's going on holidays towards the end of November. She will plan to start treatment on December 1st, so later this week. Uh, and the treating uh, physician says, which I think is reasonable and still fits within the window of the Monarch E clinical trial. And the reason that I actually incorporated it in my presentation is to say that probably you, you don't need to be super, super rush to report it because a person can get the result and then decide to go to Thanksgiving and they will come back and they will get treated. So I thought that uh, this is a complimentary uh, presentation from uh, a practicing breast pathologist. Thank you, Sharon, that's fantastic. Um, I, I actually have a, a question about the disclaimer that you put uh, in your report. Do the um, oncologists actually, you know, take note of that, or do they just kind of ignore it and just grab whatever number they want to? No, they ignore it. <laughs> Absolutely. Hmm. It's just to cover ourselves. All right. <laughs> um, and has anyone actually asked you about? you know, that little disclaimer at all, or they just no. don't want to no. acknowledge it? They, okay. <laughs> they just want to see 20% or above 20%. Right. They, they're looking on a single line here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have a question? Or experience to yeah. share? Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. I agree with everything you said. Uh, it looked great. Um, the the app itself, as as a user, I just want to encourage you. Um, if you if you have improvements to suggest, and anyone else who uses it, um, you know, we're in a position. I think Dan Hayes has given us a little bit more funding um, that we could uh, we can make improvements to uh, make it um, even more user friendly or anything. So happy to get that feedback. Great. Great. Uh, so we'll move on to the uh, next presentation, uh, which is going to be from Dr. Uh, Feng Lu. Um, you want to start? Hi, hello. Hi, I just want to say hi, hi. to Dr. Nielsen. Uh, he was my uh, teacher when I was a resident at UVC. <laughs> so nice to see you again. Hello. Uh, yeah, so everybody can hear me okay, right? Okay. Yeah. So I'm like switching between like the speaker and then my headsets and then two computers going on at the same time. So just want to make sure that there's no technological problem. And then I'm going to share my screen. I can share my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, no, I don't want this one. I want to switch. Uh, That's okay, one second. Let me just share the other screen you said. Okay, 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 uh, okay. So um, after the very uh, kind of the um, uh, novel, uh, the talk from uh, Dr. Nielsen and Sharon about the novel, uh, the newest kids on the block in terms of like breast pathology, I'm going to go back to an old problem that I'm sure um, everybody are very familiar with, but uh, um, Unfortunately, it's still a struggle for all of us, uh, which is the diagnosis of atypical ductal hyperplasia, especially on the core biopsy and the imp clinical implication. Um, uh, 
Okay, sorry, my slide is not advancing. Let me try again. Okay. So uh, the first case is that of a 71 years old female with bad or breast mass that's diagnosed on screening mammography. So then both mass were biopsied. So this is the mass from the right side. And then um, this is a, I think in total we, we received like a six cores and three blocks. And then this is a representative uh, block. And then as you can see here, you have uh, two core here. Uh, both showing sort of very busy proliferative area. And then even on low power, you can get a sense that maybe there is a kind of a papillary architecture going on with sort of fibrovascular core, fibrovascular core. And then the, the largest area of this uh, lesion measures uh, up to six millimeter. And then focusing on that area, that six millimeter, you can see that even though some of the area looks like just your conventional uh, intraductal papilloma with a little bit of usual hyperplasia, in some area, the architecture become a lot more rigid. So the, this could perform rigidity happening, uh, worrisome for atypical ductal hyperplasia, or at least some sort of atypical intraductal proliferation. So indeed, uh, this is confirmed by the CK5 staining um, so as you can see in the area, that's sort of more like conventional, usual type of plagia pattern. There is still a uh, retained uh, CK5 stain, CK5 staining. On the other hand, in the area with more cribriform architecture, uh, really uh, you have a significant uh, loss to completely absent CK5 staining in the ductal myoepithelial cell with the staining only in the a uh, ductal epithelial cell with sustaining only maintained in the uh, in the surrounding myoepithelial cell, um, and it's important to kind of correlate the staining pattern with the architecture because uh, you know sometimes I've gotten report say you know outside cases that say that like oh okay uh, um, they did a CK5 and then there's focal decrease staining and therefore they call that area focal atypia but then it's really important to take into context because you can see that even in some other area where there's absolutely no architectural abnormality the CK5 staining can be a little bit reduced as well. So this is just uh, even higher magnification. You can see that uh, indeed uh, uh, the uh, ductal proliferation has a very rigid cribriform architecture uh, with low uh, nuclear grade, um, um, consistent with atypical hyperplasia uh, in the intraductal papilloma. Uh, again, uh, just showing CK5 here just to show that like, in the my in the ductal epithelial cell, the CK5 were mostly absent, uh, and then yeah. Uh, confirming the diagnosis of total hyperplasia. Now, this is from the left breast, uh, which also shows a papillary lesion, as you can see here. But then, unlike the one from the right side, here, I will say architecture wise, there's nothing atypical. Uh, so, all the, there is no like rigid architecture going on uh, in, 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 this, in this biopsy. And then CK5 also confirming that, um, again, most of the area has retained um, uh, staining in the, my, uh, in the ductal epithelial cell. But as you can see, even here, you can see some area where there's column, whether it's been columnar cell hyperplasia or columnar cell change, or due to apocrine metaplasia, you, you, you can also get some loss of CK5, even in a papilloma with just, um, even just in the papilloma without atypia. So again, it's really important to interpret the CK5 together with the morphology and not just re uh, rely on uh, the presence or absence of CK5 staining when diagnosing a lesion as atypical or not. And then again, a higher magnification just to show that like, again, the cells, are, the cell nuclei are very bland uh, and polymorphous. And then the growth pattern definitely is uh, sort of uh, streaming and with overlapping nuclei consistent with usual ductal hyperplasia. And same thing is just uh, the same CK5 staining on higher magnification, just to highlight the patchy, patchy nature of the CK5 staining. Uh, I also did an ER on this case. I personally don't like ER as much as CK5 because the staining tend to be more diffuse, even in usual ductal hyperplasia. Um, 
so I usually prefer to do CK5, especially if I have a very limited uh, material and I want to make sure that it doesn't get cut away. I usually sometimes I will just order CK5. Uh, but then ER staining is helpful um, when, when you try to uh, decide is the lack of CK5 staining, is it due to like say apocrine metaplasia? Um, uh, uh, in that case, uh, the ER will also be negative. So in that case, it's helpful. Um, uh, nevertheless, even in this case where the CK, uh, the ER staining is quite diffuse, you can still see if you look carefully, you can still see some Dr. Pastillo saw with more variable staining um, pattern um, consistent with uh, usual Dr. Pastillo versus uh, some sort of low gray uh, a typical total proliferation. In that case, the ER staining will be a lot stronger in pretty much all the cells. So. Um, so this patient, so uh, so this patient ended up having excision of the right breast in total uh, papilloma with ADH, um, and then this is the, the section from the excisional specimen, and then on the uh, right side here you can see hemorrhage um, uh, from the previous biopsy. Uh, but then you still see some residual um, uh, in total papilloma um, again with some scatter um, atypical autoplasia, as you can see here, uh, here with sort of more rigid cubiform architecture. And then, um, so then, is, so is this, so if this is still a TPI here, is this now like a low-grade DCIS or is this still okay being atypical autoplasia? Uh, if you look at the size criteria alone, so I will say the atypical, atypical Proliferation probably span from here all the way to here. The size is technically speaking three millimeters, so that's exceeding the two millimeter uh, needed for diagnosis of low grade DCIS. But it's important to note that the ATPI is not throughout the entire three millimeter, but rather is patchy. So here you have a typical area here, more normal here maybe at least some of these stocks are normal here more atypical. So always to say that like the two millimeter uh, has to be um, completely involved. Uh, so basically, all the dots within a two millimeter has to be completely involved to to for us to be able to diagnose the case as a as a DCI as, as opposed to a typical doctor Um Yeah, and then um, uh, and then and uh, that has important clinical. Um, implication because uh, technically speaking, our uh, radiation oncologist or our oncologist will consider giving patient um, uh, uh, radiation therapy plus minus uh, hormonal therapy uh, after a lumpectomy, after the diagnosis of uh, DCIS, whether the diagnosis was made on the core biopsy or on excision. Whereas if the diagnosis is ADH, uh, on core biopsy and on excision, then they will omit the radiation therapy uh, um, and maybe mo most of the patient also probably won't take the uh, hormonal therapy either because the risk of uh, subsequent carcinoma is, is low. And then, uh, uh, and just to say that the left side, which was diagnosed as intraductal papilloma with, with ATPR, uh, um, our center, the practice is not to excise them and just follow those patients carefully, uh, um, uh, especially um, if the patient is asymptomatic, and then especially if uh, multiple cores of the of the of the lesion uh, was taken, so that the radiologist feel pretty confident that like the lesion is pretty much, you know, sampled in total almost in total by the core biopsy alone. So our condition here for, our, for Sunnybrook, whether there's ATPR or not in the papilloma is really important when it comes to the need to excise the, the lesion. Okay, so that's one of the case I like to discuss. Uh, maybe I'll just move on to the second case uh, and then I can take some question after that. So case two, Oh, case 1B, I guess. Um, it's a 54 years old female with a left breast microcalcification that was diagnosed, that was seen on screening mammography. So she ended up getting um, a core needle biopsy. And in this case, the core needle biopsy was actually done at an outside institution uh, uh, and was initially diagnosed as DCIS. Um, our clinician asked us to review this uh, core needle biopsy because uh, subsequent excision, which was 
uh, done and uh, signed up at our institution was diagnosed as at least atypical adult hyperplasia. So if the core biopsy was called DCIS, even if the excision is called only ADH, technically speaking, uh, the clinician will have to consider the patient for radiation therapy uh, plus minus uh, hormonal therapy. So, so it will make a big difference in terms of the clinical management. So uh, this is, I think in total, there was, uh, again, uh, six core, but this is really the only uh, core with findings. Uh, and as you can see here, you have an area kind of similar to the previous one, where you have area of a rigid cribriform, uh, area of uh, intradotal proliferation that has a rigid cribriform architecture. And in this one, it's maybe even more concerning than the previous one in that you can, even on low magnification, you can see there's a uh, comedo necrosis. Um, and um, uh, calcification is identified within this lesion, meaning that this is indeed the uh, worrisome calcification that was seen on mammography. However, um, you know, despite the presence of rigid architecture and ne comedal necrosis, you can see that the lesion is very tiny. It's only about 1.2 millimeter in size. Uh, yeah, uh, and um, and as I mentioned, this is the only core biopsy with any finding. So on higher magnification, you can see that definitely there's comedal necrosis and very rigid cribriform architecture. But then if you look at the, um, or maybe even higher magnification, but even if you look at even higher magnification, I hope you appreciate that, or you agree with me that the nuclear gray is definitely not high. Um, it's, uh, you know, I would say maybe low to intermediate nuclear gray. Um, uh, with still fairly uniform uh, nuclei that's about you know 1.5 to two times uh, larger than normal red blood cell, um, and um, it's noted that the presence or absence of comedal necrosis it's more common with high grade DCIS, but it's not uh, used in the grading of DCIS. Um, and indeed, I have personally seen several cases of low usual doctor plasia with comedal necrosis as well. Um, so. The presence of comedal necrosis alone shouldn't make you upgrade the lesion. So because this lesion is so small, uh, 1.2 millimeter only, um, and has sort of uh, low nuclear gray, we end up calling this case at least atypical doctor plasia. And uh, I, um, I, I didn't have the time, I didn't have the, 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 the excision uh, slides was, haven't returned to us yet, but it shows basically a focus, a tiny focus of ADH with exactly same morphology that measure only 1.2 millimeter. And then actually our oncologist was so concerned about this discrepancy in diagnosis that he asked both the core biopsy and the excision to be sent to a third center for review um, to make sure that really it's just ADH and there's no DCIS in any of the specimen. And then thankfully the the third, the, uh, the, the outside pathologist um, uh, re, uh, agree with us that it's just ADH. And therefore, this patient will not be uh, needing the radiation therapy after her lumpectomy. OK, so yeah, so I just want to show these two cases that, uh, you know, um, it's a struggle for all of us. Uh, and uh, but then can have significant clinical implication. And basically, the take home message is that if you want to diagnose something as uh, DCIS on core biopsy when the lesion is extremely small in size, meaning less than two millimeter, um, I would strongly recommend you to kind of pull back um, uh, because you know uh, if it's truly DCIS, it will declare itself on excision, and you can always make the diagnosis of DCIS on excision, and then and then guide the therapy afterwards. Thank you, Dr. I have a comment uh, while we're, before you read out the questions, Jesse. Thank you, Fang, for presenting um, this topic because it's, you know, it is the bread and butter of a breast pathologist, but we continue to struggle and to agree um, with um, one another and to be reproducible. And I guess probably one of the major changes I've noticed in my own practice since I started working independently is that I've become a lot less cavalier 
um, in when I make a diagnosis of DCIS on a core. And I always think of um, Jean Simpson when she speaks on this topic um, to, it, she calls it the bilateral mastectomy test, that if you are going to call um, a diagnosis of DCIS on the core, be ready to have, you know, both breasts on the grossing bench you know, in a few weeks time. So, you know, um, it doesn't negatively affect the patient in most cases, if you do err on the side of undercalling, um, using either the term at least ADH or ADH bordering on DCIS or um, here at UHN, um, you know, we, we use the term atypical ductal um, epithelial proliferation, which I found to be quite useful in a number of cases. So, um, you know, you don't have to be definitive, I think, um, on cores in these uh, borderline uh, cases. I think it's important to, you know, um, err on the side of lesser rather than more because you can't go back if, if there is over treatment, especially in these days where we're trying to, you know, de-escalate, um, you know, treatment um, in, in women. So thank you for pre presenting those cases. Thank you. So um, there are a few questions uh, in the uh, chat room. Um, a couple of people mentioned that uh, for papillary lesions, the arbitrary size cutoff between ADH and DCIS is three millimeters. Um, and uh, there's a question about uh, why do you use CK5 versus CK5-6 in assessment of ADH versus UDH? Uh, so in terms of the size cutoff, uh, I was trying to see. I was trying to see before the presentation where that three millimeter came from. Um, probably somebody who knows more about the literature will know, <laughs> but I never quite understand why in papilloma the size cutoff is higher than in the ADH, uh, uh, than, than in the non papillary lesion. That that never quite makes sense to me. But always to say that like definitely um, in the so that case I presented. Because the papilloma, especially because it looks like a papilloma, uh, you you probably should even pull back even more. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, especially on the core biopsy, uh, rather than calling it like DCIS. Uh, yeah, so I think I can comment on the three yeah. millimeters. I think that came from a study from the Vanderbilt group, mm -hmm. uh, David Page, where they picked the three millimeters based on um, their cutoff for, in the non-papillary set, setting, their cutoff for ADH versus school grade DCIS being two millimeter, or two ducts, should I say, they didn't use the two millimeter rule. And they estimated that, you know, two ducts, the extent across those two ducts would be about three millimeters, because obviously we have tissue in between, um, which, you know, isn't the case in a, in a papilloma because the architecture is different. So they came up with the three millimeters and then found the, um, the outcome is more um, of, um, you know, a relative risk rather than acting as a precursor um, lesion. Yeah, so it's always to say that even the, whether it's two millimeters, three millimeters, or whatever arbitrary <laughs> number you come up with, it's not based on very much, very good data. It's just, uh, it's, it's not based on very, very good data. But nevertheless, um, uh, when we practice, we all know that the treatment for ADH versus DCIS is hugely different. <laughs> so unfortunately, <laughs> even if the data you know, even even if there's there's not much scientific data to support the, the size cutoff, unfortunately we are as of now we are still stuck with it. Uh, so so I, I would say you know um, still like um, try to kind of um, use the size to justify your your diagnosis of ADH versus DCIS. I personally I I, I gave up on the two ducts thing because I have seen very very I mean it's hard to say especially on or even on excision. Uh, and especially on core biopsy, it's really hard to know like two ducts, are they actually like really 3D anatomy, like two ducts or just on this cross section, it looks like two ducts, but it's just one duct that's cut like maybe curvy, curve like this. And you just got them on this plane where they look like two ducts. So I, I personally gave up on the two ducts um, criteria. I personally stick with just the size, I cut two millimeter. And I think if the atypia is confined to the papilloma and there's no atypia in the periphery, that's very reassuring mm -hmm. um, because you know that it's easier than if you've excised the whole lesion, you're, you can be more confident um, with your margins. So it's important to look around as mm -hmm. well beyond the papilloma to see that if there's atypia, that can mm -hmm. be, that can be yeah. quite useful. That's a very good point. Yeah. 
this. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I have two questions on the chat uh, related oh, to high-grade uh, cytology. So maybe you want to uh, answer whether you apply size criteria for cases that have a non-low-grade. So high-grade cytology, I don't apply the... I don't apply the size criteria, uh, but then I am pretty chicken. So I personally, even with high grade cytology, when it's very limited, I cut less than two millimeter, I am very chicken. I end up calling something like um, a typical intraductal proliferation uh, with a highly atypical nuclear feature or something like that. Uh, highly suspicious for DCIs just to make sure that it's, it's excised. Um, but then I wouldn't, I still wouldn't go straight out to DCIS uh, because uh, like I personally remember at least one case where subsequently on excision, there was nothing. And then and then the clinician ended up deciding not treating the patient with radiation therapy. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I just kind of, even when it's high grade TPR, I, I'm very kind of, uh, I'm kind of very chicken and reluctant to go straight out DCIS if the size is very small. Um, this is uh, one final question from Mitra uh, that's, uh, that's very um, interesting. So if there is DCIS in an intraductal papilloma in a lumpectomy specimen and you have the papilloma at the margin but not the DCIS component, how would you comment on the margin status? Uh, I usually... I usually don't comment. I, I, I know our condition, they usually won't do anything if there's papilloma on the margin, to be honest. Uh, I, if it's really like completely like, you can see that it's cut in half, like it's really transected. Uh, I would say like, I would mention that it's, it's, a, it's a papilloma is transected, but I personally have never seen them revising, the spec, revising uh, that margin. I don't know if other people, uh, other places, there your your surgeon um, treat differently. But for us, like I don't think they revise when when it's benign lesion at the margin. Um, Peng, a, I think the the question was papilloma with DCIS. Yeah. So, but if the papilloma yeah, is on the margin, not the DCIS. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. I don't think our surgeon will revise that lesion. Correct. And yeah. and that that's uh, I, I might think mention it. I might it. mention yeah. it, especially when it's transected. Sometimes you know it's just a little bit touching, and you have even hard time to say is that thing still part of papilloma or sometimes it's a bit hard to say. But uh, when it's transected, I I sometimes will mention it. But I know our clinician they won't do anything about it. They will not revise that margin. Mm -hmm. And then the follow-up is, what if the DCIS component is at the margin? Well, then in that case, That's you have to mention, mm -hmm. just like any DCIS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation and certainly generated a lot of discussion. Uh, so next up, we have um, Dr. Podicarp Arrivo, and um, who's going to uh, present his case. Podicarp? Yes, thank you very much, Jesse. I'm just going to share my screen and my presentation. Should we up now? Yes, yes, it's working. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, thanks for the, uh, thanking the previous uh, presenters. They've been very uh, instructive and interesting. I'm going to be presenting an interesting case I saw a while ago and the time flies very fast. So I'm going to go straight into the case. So the case is uh, a superficial breast lesion in a 48-year-old female. She had a breast lump on the out upper outer quadrant of the left breast, um, which is a common part. We usually see lesions. And the um, important thing is that the lesion was very superficial. And there was associated a skin discoloration. Uh, now, the initially the skin had no apart from discoloration, there was no other problems. But after a, a core biopsy, they noticed some um, discharge. The patient had no history of uh, breast, no family history of breast cancer, no personal history of breast cancer. The comorbidities are listed there. They are not really contributory to the case, so I'll just keep them. 
So on mammography, the uh, lesion was a highly dense nodular lesion that there was evidence that it was close to the skin or at least connected to the skin, but the important thing was the uh, high, high density, but well circumscribed. There were no uh, suspicious calcifications. So this, um, uh, they were, well, that was the imaging on, uh, on mammography. Other imaging modalities showed a 2.8 centimeter solid heterogeneous um, superficial lesion associated with the skin discoloration. Now they reported this on the on the um, ultrasound. I think it's just an observation because I don't think you see reddish discoloration on ultrasound. Um, CAT scan showed a slightly larger um, lesion, but with what they described as fat containing. So they did a core biopsy of the lesion. And, and this is a low power image showing that the lesion is essentially fragmented pieces of tissue. It didn't, they didn't get any solid core. Uh, and um, on closer view, you could pick out some epidermal or dermal looking, epidermis looking tissue with it. And every other area was just in necrotic tissue, maybe some inflammatory cells, some keratin debris. Still a little closer, you may begin to appreciate the epidermoid, basaloid, however you want to describe it. But the difference is that you start you start seeing some of these foam cells, um, which want you know should be able to recognize as. Um, uh, um, sebaceous glands and trapped within the entire lesion. And that's all that was really um, significant in the core biopsy. Every other thing was just blood and necrotic tissue. So it was, re um, I mean, at this point, one is beginning to think, is it an um, uh, epidermal inclusion cyst? Is it a trichelemal cyst? Or, I mean, what could it be? But the core biopsy was reported as um, fat necrosis with minute fragments of viable dermal slash epidermal tissue. Um, and they noted that no mammary ducts were seen. So they really did not go into the breast tissue. And they suggested maybe the sampling was not representative. So they, uh, based on the radiology findings, they went straight for a, an excision. And this is a gross, um, image of the excision, um, a, an ellipse of skin with a slightly raised, bumpy, crater-like lesion on the surface. And uh, just adjacent to it, there was another um, um, kind of track, maybe the sinus track. Now, we noted before that this, especially this small sinus track was due to um, a previous core biopsy and the patient had started draining from it. The cut section showed a solid, a very nice, well circumscribed lesion. That was a little bit reassuring. But then it was solid and cystic with a, uh, a lobulated appearance. The areas that were cystic had this um, tan yellow uh, cyst content. And the right in the middle, you can see some areas of necrosis. Um, this is, um, you know, kind of hemorrhage from the core biopsy. The cut section, I'm uh, sorry, the um, microscopic section showed this very interesting, well circumscribed lesion made up of lobules of, you know, basaloid cells. And if you look at it at low power, when I saw it at low power, I was like, what am I dealing with? Um, and if if you go a little bit closer, you see that these lobules of cells are, well, they, they can call them basaloid, you can call them epidermoid, but right in the middle, you start seeing um, what's, um, you know, on core biopsy, they thought, they thought the pathologist thought it was adipocytes, but they're actually sebocytes. So if you go a little um, closer, 
so this hyper field shows you know most of the lesion and the, the the descriptive characteristics of the diagnosis which i'm going to show i mean some of us may already be suspecting what the diagnosis is but here we have um a well circumscribed lesion with a uh, uh, what they call the germinative layer at the periphery. And then you can see the cells kind of maturing into um, mature cebocytes in the, at the center of the lobules. And that is crucial to the diagnosis. And this is still um, a higher power. And at this power, you want to start to try to eliminate the differentials, especially um, looking for evidence of malignancy, nuclear pleomorphism, my abnormal mitosis, infiltrative borders, they are not identified in the case. And then that's a, a section showing that the lesion itself has some connectivity to the skin. And um, whoever took the sections took a very nice section through the area of uh, contact with the skin. So diagnosis is a sebaceous adenoma of breast, quite uncommon. Um, the first question that will come to the mind of a breast pathologist, is it a breast lesion or is it a skin lesion? And I will say from the um, outset that um, skin adnexia lesions in the breast are, 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 are possible, um, but for you to call it a breast lesion, you don't want to see any connectivity with the skin. And they have been described. Some uh, skin at next uh, lesions arising in the breast have been described. But sebaceous adenoma itself is a very rare lesion in the breast, in the skin of the breast. Um, but they usually present in the nipple more commonly. And they are adenomatous uh, proliferation of sebaceous glands. And cutaneous sebaceous gland is usually more common in the cheeks, in the chin, forehead, nose and other areas where you have a lot of um, sebaceous glands. Important diagnostic features I try to um, highlight, the fact that it's well circumscribed, it is multilobulated, um, basaloid germinative cells are not more than, sorry, they are more than two layers thick, and that's to uh, contrast it with sebaceous hyperplasia, which should be less than two layers thick. And if the entire lesion, if the uh, germinative layer is more than 50% of the lesion, some people use the term um, sebicoma, but then you still see the distinct maturation. Um, and that maturation should distinguish it from a sebaceous carcinoma, where the uh, basaloid cells are way more than 50% and there is no maturation. And you have to exclude um, what I did, the features of malignancy, cellular ATP, abnormal mitosis, infiltrative borders. Um, um, IHC is usually not very useful. You can make diagnosis on morphology. However, you can uh, use um, some stains to confirm the sebaceous origin of the cells. Adipophilin will tell you that it um, um, will stain uh, membranous vascular pattern of stain is suggestive of intracellular lipids, which is what you see in sebaceous uh, cebocytes. Um, androgen receptor, CK7, um, D240, and EMA will all be positive. Negative stains will include um, S100, HMB45, and um, melan A, BRP4 will all be negative. Now, one, one will do all this because you know, one at if you just see the basaloid cells, you may want to rule out some of these um, poly differentiated carcinomas or um, melanoma. The important differential diagnosis in this case, uh, I've mentioned some of them: sebaceous hyperplasia. And I've said that you need the, the germinative layer to be less than two um, layers thick. Sebaceous carcinoma is also a differential. Um, um, but I try to highlight the features of um, malignancy. And it's important to note that um, uh, um, sebaceous carcinoma is actually a, um, it, it's a, it's, well, you can have sebaceous carcinoma of the skin. You can also have sebaceous carcinoma of the breast. And like I said before, the breast lesion should not have connectivity to the skin. 
but the special carcinoma of the breast has not been described as a special tumor subtype because of um, lack of insufficient evidence. So it is called invasive breast carcinoma with sebaceous differentiation. Um, other important differentials with basal cell carcinoma of the, with sebaceous differentiation, trichoblastoma with sebaceous differentiation, uh, tumors with clear cell differentiation, e.g. renal cell carcinoma can also be um, differentials. It's interesting that this last differential is their fat necrosis, but you can see that it was um, what was it, this lesion was called initially on the core biopsy. So just the fact that you see adipose tissue and a lot of necrosis, you think it's fat necrosis. The risk factors in sebaceous adenoma are two main fat risk factors. It can occur in patients that are immunosuppressed, but it can also occur in a gen genetic syndrome, meritorious mer syndrome, which is a form of Lynch syndrome. Now, this, um, um, this syndrome is actually where you see um, at least one sebaceous cutaneous neoplasm and at least one synchronous or metachronous visceral malignancy. And so typically, um, the, the patients will undergo, at, at, typically when you see these sebaceous lesions, you should um, do an MMR, uh, MSH um, studies, and the patient, if positive, will undergo regular screening, um, especially in the GI tract or the, the um, genital, urinary tract or the female genital tract. And incidentally, this patient had, uh, so in this patient, we had, uh, we did an uh, MMR for the patient and she had uh, um, ab abnormal MSH2 and MSH6. And we had to write an addendum. Prognosis is good on complete excision. Local recurrence will usually be due to incomplete excision. And, and sebaceous pro progression to sebaceous carcinoma has not been described. So that's just a summary of the case. I thought it was interesting to share. Uh, and um, um, for me, the most interesting part was that the patient actually had um, uh, this military syndrome. And so the patient is going to be followed up with um, yeah, colonoscopies and you know um, search or screening for uh, visceral malignancies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Polycarp. Um, I think you've actually anticipated one of the questions uh, in the chat box. Um, someone was asking if MSI testing was actually performed, uh, which you responded already. Um, that's a very interesting and fascinating case. I don't think I've ever come across one before. Um, does anyone else have a question? Um, if I not, have a oh, question. I just have a comment, Polycarp. Thanks for sharing that. I haven't come across it um, either. At least I haven't recognized it. Um, just a comment about cutaneous lesions in general. They can obviously affect the breast. So if you do get an unusual looking breast lesion that you're trying to fit into, you know, a breast diagnosis always, um, you know, consider could this be um, some sort of cutaneous lesion, especially obviously if it's superficial. And I guess the one example I'm thinking of would be clear cell hydradenoma, which um, a number of years ago, um, I saw one and we were just thinking, oh, it must be a papilloma. Surely it must be a papilloma. But, you know, the, the staining did not agree with that. And eventually it clicked. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a clear cell hydradenoma. So worth thinking of. All right. Uh, so we're going to go to our final case uh, from Dr. Sarah Morgan. Yeah, I'm trying to share my screen. Oh, it's working. You see my screen? Yes. Okay, okay perfect. Um, so thank you for inviting me um, to give this to talk about this interesting case that I've uh, come across. Um, do you see the slide moving? Because for some reason, I don't see it on the Zoom. You see I, the second slide? Yes, yes, we do. Okay. Um, the one on clinical history, yes. Yeah, so this patient is a 39-year-old female who, who was referred to our center for our general surgeon 
uh, for an asymptomatic right breast mass that has been there for two years, but was recently getting bigger. And we can see from the dates that over a year, it grew from 2.6 to 3.9 centimeters. On ultrasound, the lesion looked lobulated or multinodular in appearance, and it was about the four centimeter in size. And the radiologist was suggesting, could this be a phalloidous tumor or a fibroepithelial lesion, fibroadenoma? So we went ahead and did and looked at the biopsy core, which was done. Uh, and the biopsy code is show, is core is showing uh, a transition for normal, from normal breast parenchyma to this lesion, which appears to be well circumscribed. It looks busy and it seems it has um, some tubules and also a busy stroma around them. On closer look, there is mild atypia in the epithelial component or the ductal component, as well as also in the stromal spindle cells. The mitotic figures were over 10 per 10 high power fields, but we did not appreciate any stromal overgrowth or any heterologous elements on those biopsies. We did a panel of stains. I'm just giving a few examples of those. CD10 was positive and C100 was focally positive. And the rest of the panel was really not very contributory. Um, this lesion was, uh, this specimen was sent to Sunnybrook for a double, uh, for a second opinion and a consultation. We were thinking that this is a kind of an unusual biphasic lesion, so we sent it and it came back confirming that, a typical biphasic tumor, and there was a comment with differential diagnosis, which will I defer for now. So the patient went ahead for a definitive diagnosis and she got, she got a partial mastectomy for that lesion. And on gross, um, on gross description, the lesion was about the same size as imaging. It was four centimeter, kind of lobulated, firm to rubbery with heterogeneous cut surface. And the borders were well demarcated and were ill-defined only focally. Um, so we don't have a scanner, so I can't have the, um, the whole slide image, but I tried to capture some of the periphery of the lesion, which is so showing that the lesion is actually multinodular. We can see the transition from normal breast tissue to the lesional tissue, and it also looks like the biopsy formed of two components. We see variably sized ducts that show cystic dilatation, and we also see um, a background stroma that looks busy at this power. Another view of the transition from normal to lesional tissue with the ducts and, um, and a busy stroma. Some areas of the lesion did show um, tubules that have uh, plum or cuboidal um, epithelial cells with some apical snouting and stratification. And these were surrounded by plum um, myoepithelial cells, one to more than one layer with, with, clear, with clear cell features. This is another view showing that the stroma in the background was ranging from loose vascular to hyalinized and keloid like that, like the ones in the lower part of, of the slide. And we can here appreciate that there are um, uh, cells in the background stroma that range from spindle to epithelioid. They look atypical and the ductal epithelium is from normal to mild atypical at this power. And like the biopsy, we thought, okay, this is a biophysic lesion, but we were not yet um, decided about what to call it. So the stroma here on this um, screen looks hypercellular, but there were no areas with, with good sampling that show stromal overgrowth or any heterologous elements. A small area showed necrosis, which was interpreted as related to the biopsy site rather than tumor type necrosis. Um, and this is another high power showing the cells, the, the spindle cells that were markedly atypical and mitotic figures, including some atypical mitotic figures as well. So at this point, this was our differential or if there was time I was going to um, ask the audience what they think this, could, this lesion could be. Um, and this was the, the kind of um, differential we were thinking of. I'll share with you some of the things that we did. So P63 was focally positive in some areas. SMA was um, positive, and keratin was only highlighting the epithelial and myoepithelial layers of the, duct, the, duct, the ducts or tubules, but not highlighting the spindle cell lesion. Um, and here as well as SMA highlighting the myoepithelial cells around the tubules and some of the uh, cells in the stroma. And if we look at the panel of immunostain and the morphology that we have, we, um, we appreciated that we're dealing with um, myoepithelial cells, which are the stromal cells, 
now we, we know these are myoepithelial cells from morphology and from the IHC markers. Um, this is another view showing those uh, myoepithelial cells. So we thought we're dealing with myoepithelial, malignant myoepithelial cells. And it seems from this slide that they are either emanating from um, the adjacent tubules and going into the stroma. In other areas, they were, they were, they were forming more co confluent proliferations of spindle cells. And in some areas, pushing the ductal elements aside. But um, as I said, no stromal overgrowth. And there was no formal um, DCIS or any in situ component lesion. And there was also no definitive um, invasive ductal or lobular carcinoma. These areas that I described earlier, we appreciated them in part of the lead uh, on, of the resection when we went back and submitted the whole thing. And we um, thought that this, uh, the, this is a, an adenomyoepithelioma that we know of formed of those clear myoepithelial cells. And yes, could the lesion, uh, the malignant cells have arisen from this um, adenomyoepithelioma? That was the consideration. Mitotic figures were variable. We had from seven uh, mitotic figures up to 32 in a focal area um, in 10 high power fields. And here we see that the myoepithelial, malignant myoepithelial cells out outnumber the ductal cells. Another view as well of how busy um, the myoepithelial cells were. Um, a finding that was focal and was undeter of undetermined significance until now was that some of the ductal cells showed the really atypical morphology with multinucleation smudged nuclei, but with no, um, with no architectural activity and no increased mitotic activity. And I was wondering if those are kind of degenerative atypia rather than malignancy related atypia. Um, when the case was sent for consultation, it was also suggested to do some viral markers. So I did HPV and CMV, but they came back negative. So, so far, we don't know what this ATPA could um, be explained as. So um, we were thinking, is this an adenomyoepithelioma with a malignancy arising from it? But because of the rarity of those cases and the little experience, it was sent to a tertiary center and the, 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 the diagnosis was confirmed as malignant adenomyoepithelioma or adenomyoepithelioma with myoepithelial carcinoma. So according to the WHO book, there is a chapter about epithelial, myoepithelial tumors. And this one has the pleomorphic adenoma, adenomyoepithelioma, and the malignant counterpart. Um, so the adenomyoepithelioma is considered in the WHO book as a benign or a locally uh, or a low malignant potential lesion, given the propensity that it can change into a carcinoma along the line. So these are usually um, lesions that are well circumscribed. They can grow over time more rapidly and bring attention to the patient or to the clinician. And as we know, they are formed of, uh, these are biphasic uh, lesions formed of epithelial cells and more plum and more proliferative myoepithelial cells that are often clear as shown in the picture. Um, the malignant adenomyoepithelioma, in this case also shown on the WHO, is more infiltrative. The epithelial and myoepithelial component is shown on the right side, and the, um, the high power view is showing the cytological atypia and the mitotic activity that's conspicuous in this case. Um, immunostains are notoriously not helpful in those cases because they can be very variable and unpredictable. But SMA um, is positive in most of the cases and the, and the case is negative for keratin, which excludes an important differential, which is metaplastic carcinoma. So what's the difference between the two terms, malignant adenomyoepithelioma versus epithelial myoepithelial carcinoma? So both of them allude to um, the, the potential of having a myoepithelial or an epithelial carcinoma or both. But the only difference is the presence or absence of an adenomyoepithelioma component in the lesion um, in, the, in the former versus the latter. And that justifies that adequate sampling of the lesion is also important. So these tend to occur in elderly patients. Our patient was quite young. Um, they have some driver mutations described, pic 3 ca and, and HRAS. Multilobulated, as we've seen in our case, sometimes infiltrative with malignant transformation. And the, the epithelial tumors that can arise can be either invasive breast carcinoma of no special type, lobular or special type. 
and then the myoepithelial carcinoma, which can be spindled or epithelial with atypia mitosis and increased number, uh, which can outnumber also the epithelial cells as shown in our case. Those cases are ER positive or ER negative, and the biphasic nature is key to diagnosis. Um, the prognosis is not really quite known, even in the literature, because it depends mostly on case review or small case series. Um, but it's known that metastasis, metastatic cases are reported, more commonly hematogenous rather than lymphatic. Lung and brain are the most, most common sites of metastasis. And because lymph node metastasis is rare, axillary dissection in those patients are not justified. And I'm throwing here a few articles that I found in the literature um, that, that um, the audience can go to. Back to our case, the patient, after having the lumpectomy specimen, um, our oncologists were not, were not having the much experience with this type of entity. And the patient was sent to another tertiary center for a second opinion. And the discussion at tumor boards whether to do re-excision because although the margins were negative, they were quite close. And the other option was to give the patient radiotherapy or do both re-excision and radiotherapy. But on repeat imaging, it was found something surprising was found. Another mass, which is less than two centimeters, was found lateral to the cavity of the, of the initial excision. And biopsy came back with high-grade DCIS. So the patient, the patient was consulted that it's better to do a total mastectomy to remove the cavity of the previous excision along with the area of DCIS. And surprisingly, the, the, the pathology report came back as invasive ductal carcinoma that was multifocal with more than 20 foci of invasion. The largest was two millimeter and an extensive background of high-grade dysplasia. The invasive cancer was ERPR negative and HER2 positive. And there was no residual of the biphasic malignant lesion that we found, but only a small area of the classical adenomyoepithelioma. The patient did, um, did get into several complications postoperatively, and her case was discussed again at tumor boards what to do in this case. She was found not to be a candidate for radiation therapy. And when she was um, um, consulted for or, or talking to about her septin and chemotherapy, she declined systemic treatment. Staging uh, imaging were all negative up to the last um, follow-up visit, which was at the end of this month, end of November. And she is on surveillance um, so far, and we don't have any follow-up at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That's a great case, uh, really fascinating. Um, I think we have got one question from Marilyn. Do you want to? Oh, no, she it wasn't a question. It was oh. more of a, of a comment because she did have completion mastectomy here, but Sarah's already presented it. Um, it was just makes you wonder whether some of those very atypical epithelial cells were just cancerized or not, considering the background. She had really extensive high-grade DCIS and so many foci of invasive carcinoma. Um, so it, it just kind of a thought that came to, to, to mind when she was presented later at the hour at tumor boards. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Sarah, it will be very interesting to stain your uh, adenomyopithelioma, the block that you showed with the um, atypical nuclei for HER2, because her case uh, invasive <laughs> cancer is HER2 positive, so this can uh, at least uh, give us a, a little bit of... Uh, an educational note here. Yeah, I, I did them, Dr. Nofak. I did I did the RPR her two and several sections, but actually the her two was was negative. Oh, okay. Several sections. So at least I know that whatever okay. tumor she got, at least is not arising from this one. Okay, very interesting. Anyone else have got a question? Okay, um, if not, we will conclude uh, today's meeting. Thank you everyone for participating and thank you to all the presenters. Um, don't forget to uh, fill out the evaluation form and then we'll see you next year. And of course, thank you to the moderator, Sue. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Jesse. Jesse. Thank you everybody. And that concludes our community of interest meeting for the entire year. We'll see you next year in January. Thank you. Thank you. And happy holidays to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.